word a commerce raider was regarded as dangerous, which is to say that one's return was doubtful. At the beginning of the war, Dr. Werner Hasselmann was chief surgeon in the municipal hospital of Neumünster, Germany. In 1940, he was assigned to commerce raider HK-33. Today, he again holds his old position in Neumünster. In 1940, Anthony Marshall was a sub-lieutenant on the heavy cruiser HMS Cornwall. Today, he is a director of an investment firm in London. Looking back now, my main feeling with regard to the Navy is one of gratitude, for it was a well worthwhile career. Certainly, I fulfilled the adage, Join the Navy and see the world. A few hundred miles off the coast of Africa, the lives of Lieutenant Marshall and Dr. Hasselman crossed. Two fighting men, one English, one German, relived that moment in history. I'm Jim Bishop. From the beginning of the war, it is apparent to Germany that the way to beat England is to starve her. The shipping routes which connect the British islands with the rest of the world will have to be cut. But Germany's U-boats and battleships are too few to do the job. A new weapon is needed. A ship that can prowl the Atlantic sea lanes in disguise, approach an unsuspecting merchantman, drop the camouflage, and send her victim to the bottom. The weapon is found in the deadly commerce raider. June 16, 1940. Off the coast of Germany, a merchant ship flying no flag has orders to proceed secretly to an operations area in the Indian Ocean, where she will sink or capture allied merchant ships. She is the Hilfskreuzer 33. On her bridge is Captain Ernst Felix Kreider. She is one of nine similar ships in the first wave of German raiders who will roam the enemy shipping routes as masked sea bandits. To all outward appearances, she is harmless, but in her bows, cleverly camouflaged behind concealed panels, are six 15-centimeter guns, four torpedo tubes, and a seaplane. Captain Kreider christens his ship the Penguin. He commands a hand-picked crew of 400 men. One of them is an experienced surgeon, recently drafted into the Navy, Dr. Werner Hasselmann. I have been assigned as a ship's doctor. Because of the specialty of this command, I have received additional training as a dentist. We have been told that our ship will be away from our home base for a year or more. Late in July, a tropic sun and the sight of dolphins marks the nearing of the equator. The crew of HK-33 celebrate the crossing of the line in the immemorial manner of the sea. ton British freighter Domingo de la Renaga is spotted and attacked. <laughs> he 
Before sinking, the freighter sends out distress signals, which are picked up by the British in Freetown. But the British base their plans for interception on faulty calculations. HK-33 escapes undetected. success already on her log, HK-33 sends out a seaplane to search for other enemy ships. On August 26th, a tanker is sighted. The Norwegian tanker, Fili Fiel, is captured with a cargo of gasoline and fuel oil bound for Cape Town. The following day, two ships are sent to the bottom. The tanker British Commando and the Norwegian freighter Morviken hit by a torpedo. In late September, HK-33 sinks another freighter and captures the 9,000-ton tanker Storstad. Late in October, the Penguin begins mine-laying operations between Newcastle and Sydney. November 8, 1940, news is received that the first ship to be lost in the minefields is the neutral American freighter City of Rayville. It is the first American ship to be sunk by the Germans in World War II. At the end of November, HK-33 has sunk or captured 11 Allied ships. The Raider Penguin has been an enormous success. The effect of such sinkings is a cause of considerable alarm to the Allies. Shipping is rerouted. Delays become necessary. Sailings are generally made in convoys, escorted by a handful of available destroyers and cruisers. One such escort ship is the heavy cruiser HMS Cornwall, on convoy duty in the Indian Ocean. On board is a young graduate of the Dartmouth Royal Naval College, Sub-Lieutenant Anthony Marshall. We are engaged in convoy duties ranging between West Africa, Durban, Aden, Bombay, Colombo and Fremantle. It is common knowledge that one or more German raiders are now operating in the Indian Ocean. There is even a rumor that a German pocket battleship is supposed to be here. Because of this, we have to keep our ships widely dispersed. In these vast expanses, the work of a cruiser looking for a German raider would be utterly impossible without aircraft. Without these eyes, a ship would have very little chance of finding a radar, which might be hundreds of miles away. During these many months outside of home waters, and during which we have neither a sniff nor sign of the enemy, we think of our families often. We feel angry frustration that we are living a seemingly peaceful and undisturbed existence while those at home are suffering through the blitz. When going aboard a ship on a boarding party, one must be prepared for anything. One's reception is always in doubt. I never know whether I'll be met with a bullet or be received in a friendly and cooperative fashion. It gives me an occasional opportunity for a bit of excitement and a break in the monotony of routine cruiser duties. The 
December 8th, the Penguin meets its famous sister ship, the Atlantis, at a secret rendezvous point in the Atlantic, codenamed Andalusia. These two mystery ships are the most hunted vessels on the high seas. The supply boat has brought many bags of mail, and we have each received a great amount of letters from family and friends. I'm very happy because I have many photographs from home. Our female prisoners complicate the situation somewhat. Many of our crew have had to turn their cabins over to the women. But I think that none of these prisoners have ever complained about unfavorable treatment. Captain Kreider uses some of his captured ships as temporary scouts or supply vessels. When their usefulness is finished, they are either sunk or dispatched to German ports with prize crews and prisoners. December, the Penguin heads for the Antarctic in search of Norwegian whalers operating for the Allies. Captain Kruder has learned the approximate position of the whaling fleet from documents given him by the skipper of the Atlantis. The Norwegians, completely unaware of the raiders' presence, continue their usual whaling activities. Telephone traffic between the whaling fleet is picked up by the Penguin's radio operators. From these conversations, the Germans are able to make directional bearings, and they begin to close in on their unsuspecting victims. The Norwegian whaling fleet is captured without a shot being fired. Three freighters and 11 whale catchers in the most spectacular rate of commerce warfare. German guard, the Norwegians are ordered to complete their whaling operations. It is all very interesting for us. We have never seen a whale at close quarters before. The great beasts are hoisted onto the deck and flayed. The flesh is cut into great slices and fed into the tanks where the whale oil is extracted. The Norwegians carry on the work as usual and their attitude towards us is not openly unfriendly. The Penguin and the captured whalers meet the pocket battleship Admiral Scheer at Andalusia. fall to in our white uniforms, but the parade discipline is not strict. The two ships pass each other so closely that old acquaintances wave to each other and shout friendly greetings. When we are actually opposite, the waving and cheering is tremendous. It is like a school reunion. March 12th, 1941, HK-33 arrives at Port Kubru in the Kerguelen Islands. Here in this rocky and uninhabited spot of land in the southern Indian Ocean, HK-33 can replenish our fresh water.
A stream is dammed below a waterfall and the water carried out to sea by an ingenious system of pipes and hoses. abounds in wild ducks, stormy petrels, gulls, seals, and rabbits. Those of the crew not on duty are allowed ashore in small parties. Before HK-33 sails, she is disguised as a Norwegian freighter Tamerlan. For once, Captain Kreider has time to carry out this change of appearance. March 25th, HK-33 is once again at sea and searching for new victims. Each day her reconnaissance plane is sent out, but the Indian Ocean seems to be swept bare. The main shipping routes are little used now, as Allied ships stick close to the coast for protection. April 25th, the 7,000 ton Empire Light goes to the bottom. She was bound for Durban with ore and hides. The Empire Light is followed three days later by the Clan Buchanan, carrying 7,000 tons of Army and Air Force equipment from the United States to Madras. May 7, 1941, HK-33 sights a tanker, the British Emperor. Although in flames and sinking, the British Emperor sends out distress signals that describes the appearance and exact position of the enemy raider. At 6 a.m., HMS Cornwall, en route to the Secalese Islands to refuel, picks up the distress signals from the British Emperor. The position given is about 500 miles due north of us. We turn immediately and increase our speed. One feels an aura of expectation about. Most of us, I'm sure, are wondering and hoping that the last months of routine duty and patrols are at last going to bring us to grips with the enemy. has sighted a merchant ship about 60 miles to the west of our position. The aircraft reports that the ship has hoisted signal letters which identify her as the Norwegian ship Tamerlane. Tamerlane is not on our list of ships that we might expect to meet in this area at this time. I learned that a small dot has been sighted over the horizon. Everybody is suddenly aware of the seriousness of the situation. But to give up our ship, or even destroy it, is out of the question. It is clear by now that these planes belong to a warship. We are hoping that our ship is so well camouflaged that it will give the impression of being a Norwegian freighter. Cornwall sends messages ordering the freighter to stop for a search. HK-33 attempts to mislead it by sending light signals asking for help. Still the Cornwall advances. HK-33, realizing that the game is up, takes down the Norwegian flag and hoists the German battle ensign. 
Its radio officer sends a message to the German naval command. And now engaged with British heavy cruiser Cornwall. minutes after the battle begins, a salvo of four shells scored direct hits on the raider. The last shell burst in number five hold containing the mines. There are a number of survivors in the water, all oil-stained and disheveled. We lower our boats and hang our lines down from our sides and in one way or another pick them up. To my amazement, I realize that quite a few of the survivors are British officers and men who have been victims of the radar. All of them, British, Lascars and Germans, are dazed and shocked. indeed sad to see how very few have escaped. It is some consolation to us to know that our comrades died quickly and did not suffer. The British captain makes a short speech in which he praises the fairness and courage of the German enemy when he mentions with satisfaction that with the sinking of the penguin which has sailed the seas like a ghost ship the most dangerous and most successful of all German commerce raiders has been destroyed. Of a crew of 341 men, only 60 escaped death. Of the 240 prisoners of war on board at the time of the attack, only 27 survived. Captain Kreider is among those who have gone down with HK-33. Dr. Hasselman is placed in a prisoner of war camp. In 1943, he will be exchanged as an uncombatant and sent home to Germany. There, he will spend the remaining months of the war attached to a field hospital near Neumünster. Lieutenant Marshall is on board Cornwall when she is sunk by a Japanese battle fleet off Ceylon in 1942. Later, he will volunteer for submarine duty and will take part in the North African landings and will participate in actions in Norwegian waters. The German raider Penguin captured or sank 28 ships, totaling nearly 136,000 tons. It is a record unique in the history of naval warfare.
called the Green Devils. Our motto is, you never gain anything if you are not willing to risk everything. In 1941, Fritz Mitheufer was a sergeant and a paratrooper in the Feischemjäger Division. Today he is a service representative for an automobile agency in Hollywood, California. In 1941, Gordon Laburn Smith was a captain in the Royal Australian Artillery, assigned to the defense of Crete. Today, an architect, he lives in Stirling, South Australia. People are inclined to regard war either in heroic or sentimental terms. As far as I'm concerned, all the war did to me was to make me grow up. On the Aegean island of Crete, the lives of Gordon Laburn Smith and Fritz Mithoyper came together for a brief moment. Two fighting men, one Australian, one German, relived that moment in history. March 1941. In five months of bitter fighting, the legions of Mussolini have failed to conquer Greece. Hitler comes to the rescue of his Axis partner with Blitzkrieg. Within one month, the swastika flies over the Acropolis. British expeditionary troops are forced to evacuate to the island of Crete. On the 1st of May, 1941, over 27,000 disorganized British, Australian, and New Zealand soldiers are evacuated to Crete, an important British base covering Greece, Turkey, Palestine, and Suez. One of these soldiers, a troop commander in the 23rd Australian Field Regiment, is Captain Gordon Laburn Smith. We land in Crete with no equipment whatever, not even a rifle amongst us. The troops generally are fit but very, very tired. And units which have been badly split up when they came off the evacuation beaches have to be regrouped. We're completely exhausted. And the first two weeks we spend under the olive trees around Suda Bay, just resting and trying to build up our strength. There is a large remnant who, having no leaders, are inclined to roam around in bands. As we are unequipped, we remain in the Sudabre area. The men and officers who have arrived on Crete are bitterly aware of their recent defeat. The supplies of ammunition and equipment are inadequate. Air protection is practically non-existent. Crete is 160 miles long. It possesses a large deep water harbor at Suda Bay and three airfields at Malimi, Ritimo, and Iraklion. Whoever controls Crete dominates the East Mediterranean. The German general staff has maintained that mastery of the Eastern Mediterranean is dependent on the capture of Crete. Having conquered Greece, the question of Crete must now be settled. It is the method of invasion that is open to debate. The Germans are aware of the might of the British fleet, so Reichsmarschall Goering urges an invasion by air. Only Hitler hesitates. The paratroop corps represents the elite of the youth movement. Goering is persistent. Hitler issues directive number 28. The flower of the German Reich will form the backbone of Operation Mercury, set for May 20th. One of these paratroopers, in training with the crack 7th Airborne Division, is Sergeant Fritz Mithoyfer. The training is very difficult. We learn to fall onto ground that is nearly as hard as concrete. We are trained in offensive action only, never how to defend ourselves. If we ask an officer about defense, he looks at us as if we were mad. 
When we have successfully passed these tests, we are allowed to jump. Parachute jumping is wonderful. One comes down so slowly, so peacefully. It is quite a sport. On May 12th, British intelligence reports a German invasion of Crete is imminent. The defending force on the island, known as Cree Force, is composed chiefly of Greeks, New Zealanders, and Australians. Churchill states that the island will be defended to the last man. Our positions are well concealed. We are excited at the prospect of once more meeting up with the Germans. We are expecting an attack, but as the days wear on, rather hope it will never come. These first days are particularly wearing, as food is extremely light on, and having nothing in particular to do, we brood far too much on the fact that the only planes we see are German, and they are almost continually overhead. There is no doubt about it, the Germans are having it all their own way. About the 14th of May, things brighten up considerably when rumour goes round that there are some guns available and that our regiment is to take them over. On the next day, four Italian 75s arrive, towed by trucks, and I am given command of these in order to take them to a place called Georgiopolis. We are very confident that we will be able to deal with anything the enemy offers, so long as we are not bombed into the ground beforehand. Operation Mercury, the Germans plan to land 15,000 men from the air, a unique development in the art of warfare. An additional 7,000 men will invade the island from the sea. The German objectives? Take the airstrip at Malimi and the towns of Hanya, Ritimo, and Iraklion. On the morning of May 20th, 1941, the German airborne forces are ready. Our officers have briefed us. We can expect light enemy resistance. We are confident that our objectives can be captured quickly. totals over 1,200 aircraft, including 500 Yonka transports and hundreds of gliders. The first airborne army is on its way to its first test. May 20th, 1941. 
7 a.m., the German invasion force appears over the island of Crete. We tell jokes and laugh and keep up our morale this way. I do not give a so to dang because I'm sure that I will live. I'm at my observation post on the top of a hill. Suddenly, the whole ground seems to shake with the throbbing noise of approaching planes. We are told, prepare to jump. Then comes the order, ready to jump. The moment has arrived. The world comes. Go! The spring sky is filled with hundreds of varied colored shoots. A British soldier remarks that they look like balloons coming down at the end of a party. perfect grandstand view. As a spectacle, the landings are magnificent. They come down endlessly. Most of the shoots are white, but some are red, others blue. The little figures hanging on the ends of the parachutes look not so much formidable as pathetic. troopers land on top of the waiting British. The invasion is off to a bad start when the gliders in which the commanding general and his staff are traveling crashes on takeoff. The command quickly passes to other hands, but not without confusion. In spite of staggering losses, the gliders and transports managed to land more than 5,000 men in the area of the Malimi airfield, the main target. Actually, at 11 a.m., more German transports appear and drop equipment and ammunition to the waiting paratroopers. The Australian troops at Malemi capture a complete German battle plan and succeed in breaking the code. Cree force troops are able to signal the German transports into dropping ammunition and food supplies to them instead. gives us as much support as they can, but there is much confusion. Many of our high officers have been killed and one cannot get definite orders or information. We have had heavy casualties. The British are well covered in ditches and trenches. We try to remember all the things we were told in training. My 
Their duty is to run from battalion to regimental headquarters, to keep them in touch with each other. I must get the messages through at whatever cost. I have strict orders to stay away from any action, but this is impossible. There is fighting going on everywhere. The results of the first day's fighting are costly for the Germans. The death knell has been sounded for the 7th Parachute Division, whose casualties are enormous. Hitler is so alarmed that he forbids the Berlin radio to mention the invasion until the outcome of the battle is absolutely certain. Messages from Retamo and Arachnion indicate that the fighting there is going well for us. But it's apparent that conditions at Malamy have deteriorated badly. We must hold out here. If the Malamy airstrip is lost, the whole of the island can be lost too. By nightfall, the airfields at Retimo and Iraklion remain in the hands of the British. But at Malimi, the situation is perilous. that Malimi have failed to counter-attack during the night, with the result that the Germans have obtained a foothold on the airfield. Now the Germans throw half a battalion of paratroopers into this position, oblivious to losses. Our commander has told us, push on. We move about 100 or 200 yards at a time. It is ambush fighting, and I don't like it. However, Stukas fly over and give us some protection. Our morale goes up when we see the planes. The Germans continue to bring in their men and their bombers are almost always overhead. Without any air power, it's quite impossible for our troops to attack. We fire all day onto the aerodrome. Several men have been wounded and are sent to the rear. One gun has gone out of action due to mechanical failure, but a chap remains at his post, calmly repairing the weapon. The Malimi airfield is now fully operational and German strength increases rapidly. On the morning of May 21st, a portion of the British fleet is subjected to heavy air bombardment. The cruiser Juno is hit and sinks within two minutes. That evening, the Royal Navy intercepts a German troop convoy off the coast. British sink a dozen German caiques and three steamers loaded with invasion troops. A few hours later, another German landing force is routed. 5,000 reinforcements fail to reach Crete. On the 23rd, the British pay a heavy price for their tactical victories of the two preceding days. German fighters catch the entire Mediterranean fleet without fighter protection. to the British, one battleship, four cruisers, and eight destroyers, sunk or out of action, and other units severely damaged. The fleet is forced to withdraw. 
May 26th, continuous air bombardment has reduced the British forces to small, isolated, and immobile units. Both sides pay heavily for this island. The Germans, near exhaustion because of the heavy fighting of the last few days and running low in ammunition, make a desperate assault on Hanya, the doorway to Suda Bay. After a night of intense fighting, the Germans managed to breach the British lines. The front is broken and further British resistance becomes futile. The Australians and New Zealanders are tough fighters. When we approach their lines, we are worried. But we find their positions are empty most of the time. They have left, pulled back. Maybe they find out that we are ready to move in. Certainly, the end of this fighting will not be far off. Early in the morning of May 27th, the decision is taken to evacuate Crete. The last retreat from Europe begins. From now on, it is a matter of getting back to the beach at Sparkia in the best order that we can. The withdrawal is carried out superbly and at no time turned into a rout. The roads do not appear to be filled with troops and the guns always have easy travelling without traffic jams. The infantry moves back steadily, if wearily. The whole effect is curiously gentle, but this is still the gentleness of a wild beast, worn down by the hunting pack, but still quite willing and eager to rip and tear if approached too closely. The Germans are still to find that we are not yet beaten and they are given no chance to rush us or to hurry us. We are hungry, we are tired, we are angry. And we cannot or will not understand why we are once more moving in the wrong direction. If we must move this way, we will do it in our own time. The Germans can occupy the ground behind us, but only at our pleasure. Fifteen thousand British are saved from the rocky beaches, but thirteen thousand are left behind, killed or captured. This is the final bitterness. Ahead of us looms long years of heartbreaking prison life, but this is in the future. At present, we are too near exhaustion to even think. I'm proud to say that the men who are forced to surrender on the beach at Sparkia, my friends from Australia, New Zealand and the United Kingdom, are still undefeated. Within ten days, Crete has fallen. Gordon, Labour and Smith, taken prisoner on the beaches of Sparkia, will spend four long years in Germany before being liberated on VE Day. Fritz Mitteufel will leave Crete to fight in the Russian campaign. Later at El Alamein, he is captured by the British. Crete was quickly won, but at a staggering loss. In the very skies in which, according to legend, Greek gods first took flight. Both stories ended in tragedy. Thank you.